All right, you know, sometimes when I set out to film a video, and I imagine this happens to everybody, you start off with an idea and then it kind of takes its own form and turns into something a little different. Today I started off wanting to compare Lincoln Excalibur 7018 to some Hobart 7018 I got from Tractor Supply. I wanted to do the comparison on vertical uphill lap joints, quarter inch thick metal. That's roughly six millimeter thick metal. And I'm using 332, that's 2.4 millimeter, 7018. And just stuff happened and it just turned into something a little different, but I think we can all learn something from it anyway. This is not a sponsored video. Yeah, and you'll see you'll see that as I go along. All right, let's let's do it. All right, what I started out to do was compare these two electrodes, some Hobart 332 7018 with some Lincoln Excalibur 7018, and and the Lincoln have been left outside. You can see there's a little rust on them, and I've only got a few of them. The Hobart have been kind of kept in this little plastic case, but neither one of them has been kept in an oven. But these are in better shape. They've been indoors. These have been outdoors. We'll see what happens. I'm using this little old school Miller Thunderbolt ACDC machine I got off Craigslist for somewhere around 200, 300 bucks. I don't remember exactly. And just as a quick reminder, I did a video not too long ago setting this thing up using a scratch start TIG. That's the benefit of having an ACDC stick welder is that you can also do scratch start TIG with it. And all you need is an argon bottle, a flow meter regulator, and this little adapter right here. Uh, to hook up a TIG torch. Your TIG torch needs to have a valve and you're, you need this adapter. It's a power cable adapter. It's the part number 105Z57. Look it up on Google, on Amazon or somewhere. You'll find it pretty easily. Uh, that's really the main thing that you need to, to, to adapt this thing and you just hook your stinger on just like that and then you're ready to do scratch start TIG and you need to be on DC negative, DC electrode negative. Now with this machine, uh, setting the amperage is a little bit of a chore. You can see it says AccuSet amperage control as if it's accurate. It's not that accurate. There's a lot of slop in that handle. So I had to put a meter on there to really kind of dial in my amperage settings. But, you know, it's close enough. You can you can kind of gauge just by sight. But I'm going to do a little quick, quick shot here of a sort of a handrail type joint with scratch start TIG using this little unit before we get into the stick welding. And you can see the arc is plenty good enough, plenty smooth enough to do to do TIG welding. Problem is really snapping out of the puddle. That's really the biggest problem with scratch. Not a big deal starting the puddle. The biggest the biggest problem is snapping out of it and then leaving a crater or a gray area that's oxidized. But you can do some pretty decent work with a scratch start TIG unit. I'll show you one more little little run here before we get into the stick welding. You see I'm just scratching the, the electrode. You can also flick the wire on the electrode to get it started, but you know it's it's like a once you get it started, it's not much different than any other TIG welder. Okay, let's get into the stick welding now. We're on DC positive, DC electrode positive for 7018s. And uh usually with a 332 7018 rod, I wind up being around 90 amps. See, it's set on right at 90 amps there as accurately as I can set it. But, you know, again, this thing's got as much slop in it as the old, you know, 1970 Chevy work truck that I had on the steering wheel. It's, uh, it's just not so precision. But, you know, it's, you can make it work. That's why they call them buzz boxes. This thing has really kind of got a loud hum to it, but... It, it runs pretty good. And so first off, I'm going to use the 332 Hobart. And I'm just going to run some beads with it. I'm going to kind of shake the rust off. I don't run stick that often, so I need to kind of I need to practice. And you'll, as you'll see as this video goes on, I need a lot of practice. But just running a bead down the edge of this quarter-inch thick steel just to kind of get my hand in it. And also, I'm going to run the whole rod out because I want to show you something here at the end as I burn the whole rod off. And that is basically when you burn a whole rod, a whole 332 rod, and you see it's starting to be glowing red, you know you're kind of at the high end of what you should run there. You shouldn't run a whole lot hotter than that. It starts melting off differently when it's red hot like that at the end. But you know you're at close to 90 to 100 amps when it's glowing red like that. This is the Lincoln, this is the Lincoln 7018 Excalibur rod. And it wasn't quite glowing at the end, but you notice the slag is coming off a whole lot better on the Lincoln than it is on the Hobart. 
All right, so I'm going to drop it down to about 80 because we're going vertical uphill now on this quarter inch thick lap joints here. These are some little pieces that I ordered from the James F. Lincoln Foundation. They actually have a little Boy Scout merit badge metal kit. And then they have these little pieces of quarter inch thick metal. And that's where I got it from. You can see the, the puddle is kind of following the arc here. So it's a little colder than I would like it. It's okay. It's easily controllable. But I would like it a little bit hotter. But that was my starting bead. And I'm going to turn it up. I'm going to go ahead and run the vertical uphill at 90 as well from here on out. After I ran a couple more, here's a here's the third or the fourth one. You can see that as I move the electrode around a little bit, that the puddle is not quite chilling behind the arc as much as it was on the first one. And that's kind of what I wanted. All right, let's chip the slag off all those. You can see the very first one all the way to the far right. A little bit I'm a little bit rusty and then as I go along it gets a little bit better all right we're going to use the Lincoln Excalibur here and you can see they're kind of rusty and I only have a few of them left um, but they've been outside they haven't been in the oven or anything like that well you know I'll write an article about that on my web page you can click to that web page in the description box of this YouTube video but this is what that arc looks like at 90 amps you see that the, the uh, puddle is not cooling behind me a whole lot and I think it's running pretty good. And when I chip off the slag, that's really that's really kind of what tells the story. It just it's just a better looking bead, really, and the and the slag comes off a lot better. Now, does that make it a better bead? Probably not. You know, this is the very last of the Lincoln Excaliburs that I had. You can see I'm I'm kind of shooting at a really pretty true 90 degree angle, which is a good idea to shoot for on vertical welding like this. I'm kind of cue sticking with my other hand there so I don't leave any arc strikes on this bead. I didn't get an arc shot of that, but you can see it came out a little bit better than the previous ones. And so next up, because I'm out of the Lincoln rods, I'm going to go ahead and try a two-pass weld on this with the Hobart rods. So the first pass, kind of a root pass. I'm just concerned with penetrating into the root and not worried about taking it all the way out to the edge here. Couldn't make it all the way up with one rod. Again, I'm going to, you know, kind of cue stick with the other hand to prevent leaving arc strikes all around. I've only got a little ways to go. A rod can kind of heat up and make your, you know, fingers kind of hot if you're not careful. So I just hold it very gingerly when I'm doing that. All right, the first pass, yeah, it looks okay. The slag comes off pretty easy. But now we'll do a, we'll do a second pass here with the, the, the Hobart 7018s. With just a little bit of weave, just a little bit of oscillation, trying to pause on my left, on the left side there, so that I don't leave any low places or undercut. Pause just for a little bit, holding kind of a tight arc on both edges. And for a restart here, you know, I'll, I'll try doing this without the cue stick method and just kind of light up just ahead of the arc, pull it down into the crater, and then keep going. Same technique though, it's pausing momentarily on the toes of the weld to not leave any undercut. And we'll see how that does at the end here. Now we're going to cut and etch all these things and um, we'll really, really see some things as we do that. First up is the Hobart 7018 that I got from Tractor Supply. Uh, single pass welds, 332. Nothing glaringly wrong there. Even the one that looked kind of cold to start with turned out just fine. Let's take a look now at the Lincoln Excalibur 7018. Looks a little different as far as the structure of the weld. Like the weld nugget, you know, is, is not as discernible. The, maybe the grain is, is a little bit more refined. Maybe not. I don't know. It, but it looks fine. Now let's look at the two-pass uh, weld with the Hobart rod here. Now pay attention to this here because this is the money shot. See the big difference in the way the first pass and the second pass looks? You're always going to see a difference. You're, you're always going to be able to distinguish a first pass from a second pass like this when you cut an edge. But the it just looks like a much finer grain structure and, and a coarser grain structure on the second pass. And that's because the weaving is a slow travel speed a lot of heat input, the cooling rate is very slow, the grains are allowed to grow. It does affect fatigue properties. Now, 
whether it's acceptable or not it just depends on the application but this is a good demonstration on the difference and why that you know weaving is frowned upon in certain welding codes there is a difference before I wrap this video up I'm going to stir the pot just a little bit here with a true or false question true or false 7018 rods are low hydrogen rods and need to be kept in an oven all right, in, in the description box below this YouTube video, there's a link to my website. It says, for a more detailed article on this subject, click here. That'll take you to a web page where I, where I talk about low hydrogen rods, uh, when they need to be kept in an oven and when they don't, etc. Also, feel free to leave your comments below on what your take is on that. All right, see you next time. Oh, and just a quick reminder, I support these videos with the sales from my online store at weldmonger.com. Thank you.